For it says here that every eye will see Him. When He returns to the earth, He will return as commander. The first time He he came to be crucified on a tree. But when He comes again, He will come to reign upon a throne. The first time that He came, He came as a Savior. But when He comes in the days ahead, He will He will come as sovereign, the sovereign of all. And there will be no doubt about who He is as all eyes will see His beautiful white robe dipped in blood. There will be no doubt that He is the one that they pierced and crucified. For His name is written, He is the Word of God. And we will see Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who He truly is. The first time He came, He came as a child that was born in a lowly manger. But when He comes again, He will come in all of His splendor, in all of His glory, and in all of His power. He will come in authority. And John says that not only will every eye see Him, but even those who pierced Him. Look at this Old Testament prophecy in the book of Zechariah. It talks about His piercing. In your outline you see Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. The scripture says there through the prophet Zechariah, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, it was proclaimed and prophesied that He would be pierced. And we see this piercing uh, proclaimed in the Gospel of of John. If you look at the Gospel of John at verse 19, the Scripture describes here through John this piercing. It says in John 19, 34, Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may also believe. John is speaking of himself here. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. The piercing of Jesus' side simply magnifies the fact that Jesus was rejected and despised. It simply points out the fact that he was rejected as the coming Messiah. And that there was great unbelief as to the claims he made to his divinity. However, the prophet I, I, John, uh, John, the gospel writer John says this in John 1.11. He came to that which was his own, and his own received him not. So he was pierced. The prophet Isaiah said that he was despised and rejected of men. The crucifixion was the ultimate example of the rejection of Christ. And yet, at His revelation, even those who rejected Him and pierced Him, even those who despised Him and spat upon Him, will see Him as Sovereign Lord, will see Him as the true Messiah that He claimed to be when He was on earth. The prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah 45, 23, By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. And the scripture says in the New Testament these same things in in the book of Romans 14, 11. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. On this day that John sees, described in Revelation 1, 7, where every eye will see him, every Christ rejecter, every Christ hater, everyone who has denied the name of the Lord, everyone who has Uh, rejected Him as their Savior and Lord will see Him with their own eyes and they will fall to their knees, they will fall to their face and they will acknowledge the one true fact that Jesus Christ is Lord and that He is King. There is coming a day where every knee will bow before Him 
And as John speaks of in verse 7, he says, all the people, all the peoples of the earth, this word speaks of all races, all nations, all tribes, all clans. Everyone will recognize and acknowledge Christ as Lord. And in John's words, we see that not only will he be recognized, but verse 7 points us to something very sobering. And that is the fact that when Christ returns this time, it will be a day of, of retribution. It will be the day of judgment. His patience has run out at this point. And we must get to that point by moving through this book. But we see here just a, a sneak preview of what will happen on this day. And again, we see these uh, events described in Revelation 19. It says, All the peoples of the earth will mourn uh, because of him. And that word mourn means literally to beat the breast in grief. And you understand that in this hour of retribution, it will be an hour of his wrath, and it will be poured out on all those who have continually rejected him and who have continually denied him as Christ. This will be the hour of their judgment and it will be a, an hour of great terror and of great grief. And the blood will flow upon the streets. A terrible day of wrath is coming for those who continue to reject Him to the very end. So He comes again. And He comes to conquer. And then the Scripture tells us that he is the one in control of all of these events. He is the one who, who holds time and circumstance in His hands. And He moves history to certainly accomplish what He has willed and prophesied for the future. Every promise that He has made will come true because He is in control. He is in, he's the one who controls history. It says here, and I point out, that His name is called the Almighty, the All-Ruling One. He is in charge. He is in control. This name is used nine times in the book of Revelation to remind us that He is the one in charge. Jesus is the Almighty. Yet you pick up the newspaper, you turn on the news on the TV, and it wouldn't seem at all that He's the one in charge. Events around our world seems so chaotic. Economies that crash, nations that war with nations, and all of the evil that we see, and you wonder, is he truly in charge and in control? But we must be certain of the truth that he is the one that orchestrates world affairs, and he is leading all events that we see to come to the culmination of what he has promised will be. As the controlling one, you look in verse 8, where the Lord says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In these words, we see that Jesus proclaims His control. He says, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It would be the same as us saying, I am from A to Z. He is all. And we understand by that statement a couple of things. One thing we understand is that He is the subject of this word. Jesus Christ is proclaimed and presented in every book of this Bible. He is the beginning and the end of this word. He is the subject. He is the author of all that is contained here. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And we also understand from this statement that He's the sovereign of the world. He's the sovereign of the universe. We read in the book of Revelation where Jesus Christ is the one by whom all things are created. We also read through Scripture that Jesus Christ is the one by whom all things are sustained. He holds all things together. And then in the book of Revelation we see that He is the one through whom all things conclude. He commences all things in the beginning. He concludes all things in the end. He is the Alpha and He is the Omega. And not only do
Do we see his control? But we also see that it extends through all time. You see in verse 8 where he says, Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He was in control in the past. He is in control today. He will be in control in the days to come. Throughout all of eternity past, throughout all of eternity future, He is in control. And someone might read through the book of Revelation and wonder, can these things be real and will these things truly happen? And we must know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they will occur just as they are written because He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is in control and in charge. And all these events will happen just as He, just as he proclaimed. Because He is in the one, he, he is the one who directs everything so that it will happen just as He promised. So, as we move through this book together, we read of things that are predicted for the future. And we must know that they will take place just as they're written. And we know this for sure because He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one who, who is and who was and who is to come. And as we think about the terrible day in the future where He will pass His judgment upon the nations and the peoples that have rejected Him, we understand that it is this terrible day that gives us the motivation to be busy about His work, to purify our hearts before Him, and to be eager to pour ourselves out so that others may know of His grace and mercy. Today we live in the day of grace. Today it is not too late to come to Him. But there will be a day written on His calendar in the future where He comes as judge and conqueror, and it then will be too late. This terrible, sobering thought motivates us to go out from the walls of this place and proclaim His truth and His love. It proclaims us to take every resource that we have in this church and pour it into the missions and the ministries that others may know Him. Oh, this morning it's so great to see Hans and Rosalind here. They've given... Uh, Hans and Rosalind Bergen have given their lives as mi missionaries through uh, an organization known as OM Ships, an organization that we love and pray for. And OM Ships has the purpose to carry the gospel of Christ into the port cities of our world, to reach others for Christ. At great expense, the word is carried throughout the world because there is no cost that is too great that others may know him. And so we have this urgency in our hearts as believers to carry the gospel of Christ to all that they would know Him. Because the day is coming when He returns as judge and conqueror. And it will be too late at that point. So the important question this day is, do you know Him as your Savior and Lord? Have you gotten on your knees and asked Him to forgive you of your sin through Christ? Have you come to Him broken, knowing that you need a Savior? Because the Scripture says when He comes again, He will come as a thief in the night. We do not know of that day and of that hour. And so today is the day of grace, and today is the day of salvation. If you have not surrendered your life to Him as your Savior and your Lord, I plead, I urge you to do so today. Simply ask Him to forgive you of your sin. Ask Him to reign in your life as your Lord. And the Scripture promises that all who call upon His name shall be saved. You will be sealed and you will be secure for all the events in the days ahead. And forever your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. You will become the child of God not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, but the fact that God loves you and He died for you and He arose to conquer sin and death forever. He extends His arms to you to be your Savior and Lord. Will you receive Him today? Amen.